So ladies and gentlemen, today I have a pleasure of interviewing a person who actually interviewed me once two years ago for Sri Jyoti Star Magazine. And I'm delighted to have him here today, Mr. Simone Chowiski. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Yeah, that's, you get a B minus on that one. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> it's Chokoisky, but you know what? Chukoyski. Nobody gets it right. My mom even forgets what it is. So, so you're off the hook. So what really, I mean, fascinated me about you, especially when I got some of your learning materials, I'm like, my God, this man makes things simple. That's it. That, that's, that's what he does. He makes things simple. Like one of the things that really fascinated me about your knowledge, especially your Vastu knowledge. I, I had five minute lesson from you about Vastu Shastra, which huh. is, I think probably sums up 10 years of work and like you don't even need 10 years of knowledge if they saw this five minute lesson from you, you know what thank you for it? coming we'll see you next time appreciate exactly. it was... <laughs> okay the what one was thing it? that you said in one of your uh, webinars about how if your front door is weaker than the windows yeah. and if your front door is not strong the lagna is not strong of the person who's living in there so yeah. if you make the front door, the entrance strong, bold, it shows that the person has control of their life, their home, their house. And I'm like, my God, that's it. Like yeah. taking the lagna as the door. And, and it's amazing how you said, if I see so many windows, there must be so many people living in there and overpowering the person. Yeah. You remember- Especially if the was. windows are larger than, than the yeah, door. Yeah, larger They're than the door. Significantly, yeah. and you have this little wimpy door, then the owner of the house, the head who is supposed to be the head of the house, will yeah. feel overwhelmed by the kids, by the people living. By, exactly. And uh, it's so funny because I have so many windows in my house, and I've got five dogs, two cats, two toddlers, uh -huh. driving me nuts 24-7. Yeah. So I saw it, I'm like, oh my God, this man is like so good at predicting these things. So this is, was a very powerful knowledge, but before that, I just want to know, I mean, how did you come up with this cathedral of information in your life? How did you start? With well, all credit to, uh, to the parampara, right? To the lineage and to my teachers. Uh, my first uh, uh, Jyotish teacher and best Jyotish teacher is Hart Defoe, and, uh, and then his teacher, Mr. Mantri, uh, who passed away recently, and um, it's through great teachers that we enter the flow of this lineage, and however much we're able to sip from it depends on our capacity, right? Yeah. But they're the ones who bring us to that to that flow, to that water. And um, and also Dr. Vasan Lad, who was my teacher in, in many things, uh, particularly Ayurveda, um, his institute in Albuquerque, New Mexico, called the Ayurvedic Institute, a little plug for them, is uh, truly a, um, a hub of Vedic uh, wisdom, especially in the U.S. Um, so those were, they were my introductions to Jyotish, to, to Ayurveda, and how they all speak the same language. Because you know, in science, a chemist can talk to a physicist and can talk to an astronomer through the language of mathematics. Mm -hmm. They have that shared lingua franca. We have uh, in the Vedic tradition, we have the five elements, we have the, um, the, the Vedas, we, have, uh, we also have a similar language. So when we say that Saturn is on your ascendant, someone who knows the Vedic tradition will go, okay, Vata body type, right? Fear, you know, fear and anxiety will tend to be the primary emotions, thin, um, slow, right? We, we, we come up with all these key words and, and they're not all related to Jyotish, some of them are Ayurvedic, some of them are Vastu related. So, um, uh, so, so all of these Vastu, Jyotish, they all speak the same language. And when you look at someone's house or someone's door, you can tell a lot about their chart often. And um, anyway, so all, all, all glory, all praise to, to my teachers. So, I mean, um, how far back did you get into this uh, world of mysticism, occult? And what were you doing before that? You know, I'm a, you said I put things in a very simple way. And I think yeah. uh, I'm a Taurus Lagna. I'm very practical, material, kind of basic. That's kind what of I love about you. I'm like, this guy is just, just practical. He just gives you like 
the tidbit knowledge that just helps technical, like straight technical person, like who just knows what is happening. Well, for me, if it's 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 got to work in the real world. Otherwise, it's just theory. If if, yeah. it's, if, if it's you can have the best theory. In fact, I, I include a, a quote in in my latest book from a physicist named Richard Feynman, uh, Feynman, who says, you know, you can have the most beautiful theory. Here, let me do him justice and actually yeah. the actual quote. He says, it doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is. It doesn't matter how smart you are. If it doesn't agree with experience, it's yeah. Done. yeah. And mm -hmm. that's been my approach is if this stuff works in real life, then we use it. If not, then, you know. We and especially it. this has been the most practical use for me. This you got it. Awesome. of yours, which I got a while back, it's been so, pr like, I'm like, you're going through like planets through houses and you just go straight to what the planet will do. You don't go into even like, cause I know your students might be beginners. They're like fourth house sun, this, 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 Saturn in the 11th, this, this. I'm like, that's right. You just, he's so true about, uh, like you just go straight to the bullet points, which I love. That you know what happens though? Like we get so advanced or we think we're so advanced that we forget all that stuff. Yeah. Sometimes we're doing readings and I'm like, all right, what is the Ashtaka Varga looking like? Let me do yeah. some KP. Let me look at this really fancy sub charts. And then people go, hey, what does Saturn in my ninth house mean? And you start telling them and they're like, oh my God, that's brilliant. And I'm like, yeah, that is kind of brilliant. And yeah. It's so simple. It's so simple. So sometimes we as advanced astrologers tend to forget the basics and why the basics are the basics. They are, they're the free throws in, in yeah. basketball. If you can't make a free throw, you know, it doesn't matter how good you are. You can't, if you can't shoot. Um, so no matter how talented we are, the basics are always um, important. I see. And, um, how, and how far back was this when you started this journey of yours? So um, I was a, uh, that was your original question. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, um, I was a French major in college. Then I went on to become a physical trainer, a sports uh, a trainer. But the whole time, um, it was Dr. Deepak Chopra who introduced me to the Vedic tradition. Wow. And not personally, you know, I was never, oh. never, you know, I didn't run in, I still don't run in those circles. Uh, uh, but I went to his center to learn a meditation. And uh, there at the meditation school, the guy kind of saw, you know, I didn't have any money. And, he said, and I said, you know, how can I pursue my studies in this? And he knew he couldn't afford the Chopra Center and whatnot. And he, it was this Jamaican guy, and he said, man, you got to go to the Ayurvedic Institute. Go see Dr. Ladim, the real thing, man. <laughs> and, 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 and of course, I'm not doing him justice. He was an amazing guy. But he said, go to the Ayurvedic Institute, plug into the tradition there, and that's what I did. And that opened up my life. That was in 1997, I believe. Okay. And yeah. which type of uh, Jyotish um, have you learned? Because there's, you know, different schools of thoughts, like, there's Parashra, Jaimani, you know, Prigu, Nadis, and then KP. Like, which one yeah. have you done? My, so my, yeah, my preferred is starting with the Parashari system. I think everyone starts with mm -hmm. the standard Parashari system, learning yogas, learning basics. And I've moved on to KP for me is, uh, is a very special kind of practice, uh, partly because mm -hmm. my own teachers studied in that lineage. Okay. Um, okay. I have utmost respect for Jaimini and for, or for the Brigo systems. I just haven't had the introduction to them through, you know, uh, um, bona fide uh, sort of gurus. And, 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 and besides, it takes a lifetime to just master KP or to just master one thing. And why dig 10 wells, you know, right. uh, when you can just focus on one? You know, I, I'm sure you've had teachers like this as well where they could scribble a chart on a piece of paper yeah, oh yeah. and just start telling you everything that's about your life. Yeah, yep, that's no right. subcharts, no degrees, nothing. No. And you're Absolutely. like, how in the world are they doing that? Yeah. Like right when you were telling me about your major in French and English, see, this is where I think the benefit comes in of two different systems. I'm like, man, I mean, he must have Jupiter or Venus affecting his fifth house from Karakamsha Lagna, which is one of the alternative ascendants of James. Mm -hmm which kind of gives interest towards classical literature, classical knowledge, 
you know, mm-hmm. linguistics comes in with Ketu. So th- that's where I found, first I was like all Parashra, Parashra, but then I'm like, okay, so some of the things I'm, I'm not getting through. And then yeah. when I learned Germany from Mark Boney, I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. So, but, but I know in KP versus Parashra, in KP, don't, they don't really look at the divisional charts, right? They mainly no. Versus the- so he, here's, here's a subtle distinction that I think not a lot of people understand. So in Parashra's system, the subcharts account for what essentially are cusps that Western astrologers and KP astrologers use. So a KP astrologer will use a house cusp, which means that we use a whole sign system in, in Parashari. So yeah. if you're in Aries Lagna, you're Taurus second house, Gemini yeah. third house. But in actuality, depending on when you were born, let's say it's the middle of winter and days were really short, then your second house may be very big. It may, uh, it may comprise Taurus and Gemini. And so the cusps of the houses will move. Okay. Um, and so KP uses the precise cusp. Parashri astrology uses sub- subcharts to account for those minute changes in the signs. So, okay. um, yeah, KP and Western astrology don't use those harmonic charts. Uh, it's just a different system, it's a different way. Like if your back hurts and you go to a chiropractor and a naturopath, you're going to have two different approaches. Yeah. But health and healing is this, is the goal. Right. And in your studies of the Jyotish, how, how how important do you think divisional charts are, knowing that you have come across Guru who just looks at the chart and just start spilling out the whole life? Well, I think they're very important personally um, because uh, we studied uh, the Shishadri Ayer method of divisional chart interpretation, which includes the yogi, the other yogi, um, which includes, for example, the technique of Karako Bhavanashaya. Yeah. which is, right, if you have Venus in your seventh house, it would tend to depress relationships or mm-hmm. Jupiter in your fifth house in the main chart. But you can apply that to subcharts. So if you have Mars in the D3, Lagna, that's tantamount to having Karaka Bhavanashra. The Karaka, the significator for siblings, Mars, in the Lagna of that chart will either re- completely deny siblings or at the very least, um, harm your relationship to them. Mm-hmm. Likewise, Jupiter in the Lagna of the D7 creates a, y- y- your listeners should check this in their own lives and in their clients, will tend to depress uh, children. Uh, Venus in the Lagna of the D9, we think, oh great, you've got Venus in your relationship chart Lagna. No, it actually creates problems in relationships unless that planet is in its own sign uh, or exalted, but usually just in its own sign. Then it has dignity. So I use the subcharts a lot. I use them for rectification as well. So if someone says that they graduated with a PhD during such and such period, and I look at their D24, the subchart for education, and that planet was in the 12th house or in the 8th house, it's not likely that during that period they graduated. So that will help me move and adjust the time if, okay. if it's a question to a more suitable chart. And then I'll look at each of the sub charts and make sure they all line up with that person's uh, events in their life. So Does that make sense? So, yeah, no, absolutely. But in your studies, which divisional charts that you always feel like supersedes everything that you must look at? Well, um, when I'm looking at a sports match, for example, the the Navamsha is critical. Yesterday there was a game, Atlanta Braves versus Oakland, and Atlanta was a huge underdog. But I pulled the chart for the moment the game began. I actually watched it start. And so when my wife says, honey, what are you doing? I'm watching the game. She's like, oh, you're working. Okay, I'll leave you alone. She knows. Okay. So I noticed when the game started, that moment, Mars was exactly conjunct the D9 Lagna, meaning that even in the Navamsha, I pull the degrees, I calculate the degrees. And I've learned from watching dozens of dozens of games with that combination that the favorite team, the team that everyone thinks will win, is not going to win. That's what happened. 
Um, so in the Navamsha for sports prediction, the Navamsha is the most important chart for sports. Mm -hmm. Can you take it outside of sports? Of course. That's why I study sports because there are these miniature space time events. And if you can make a prediction that's correct, then you can make a prediction for people. We are also space time events. Yeah. You were born in a place and time, right? And, and, and so was a game. The game happens at a specific time and place, except its lifespan is very short. So you can test your predictions to know if you're right or wrong. Sometimes you'll tell a person, oh, you will have a baby in 2024 for yeah. sure. Yeah. Baby's coming. Well, how do you know if you were right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Whereas with the game, two hours later, you know if you were right or wrong. So that's why I use sports to, as a laboratory to sort of figure out which stuff works and which doesn't. So the Navamsha is very important. And I think most astrologers would agree with that. Uh, I know that in Brugu and, and in different systems, you use the, the D60 as well. And um, but it, I guess it depends on the system, but I use the standard D charts, the D9 for relationships, the D4 for property, the D7 for children, the D3 for siblings, the D12 for parents, D24, I found to be very useful for education. Because think What's about the D24? the D24, the Siddhamsha, the D24 for education. Mm -hmm. Because if you're looking at a person's profession and their chart, the regular chart isn't so clear, the, their level of education will have a lot to say about what their uh, um, uh, potential is in this lifetime for work. For example, to be a doctor, you have to go to school. To be a lawyer, to be an architect, an accountant, you need four years of college. And if a person's D24 is not good, like mine, I have a bad D24, it's all eighth house stuff. Meaning that I actually stopped school. I was a French major, but I left school. I couldn't complete college, no matter how much I tried. And later I looked at my D24 and said, oh, that's fine. It was all eighth house. Eighth house meaning or ancient oral tradition. And that's sort of where my life went. But now if I look at a client's D24 and see that kind of thing, I'll know that they're probably not a, a lawyer or a doctor or someone who needed to go to four to eight years of school. Okay. So I use that for education in part, along with the main chart, of course. So D charts are supplemental charts, in, in my opinion, but they give us a lot of clues. So this is fascinating, especially with the sports thing that you just said. So usually when people are trying to study sports, they're like, well, I need uh, exactly when the team was formed and when this team was formed. And then I look at their chart. But yours is such a simple method that when a match starts, pull up Prashna for that match. Mm -hmm. And I remember you said the home team is the ascendant and Always. the home team is the seventh house. Correct. And then you have the Navamsha to look at some of the trickery and because like your Mars thing, I didn't know that like, oh, Mars and the ascendant of Navamsha. It, it's, it's a special little technique. Um, okay. Actually, let me correct that. The home team and the away team uh, in standard astrology, that's what you use. But I found the most effective method is the favorite team is the Lagna. The favorite team is the one that everyone expects to win. The underdog team is the seventh house, the opponent. This is how Western astrologers uh, do it. And I found it to be the most effective method for judging contests. So you pull the chart for the moment the game begins and the favorite team. Now, what does it mean to be the favorite? And how do you yeah, know who's yeah, your favorite? Yeah, yeah. This is where you have to go. You gotta watch ESPN and whatnot. Well, yeah, or just Google it. And what will happen is, and this is how like, I got introduced to gambling actually, is because those sites list which team is the favorite to win. And favorite is simply nothing but Kala Desha Patra, meaning the, the time, space, or Desha Kala Patra, however you wanna say it the time, space, and capacity of the team. Because those gambling sites, they know what the pitcher had for lunch yesterday, if they were fighting with their wife. I mean, okay, maybe not that specific, but they look at everything and they give you the uh, Desha Kala Patra of that game, that this team is gonna win and by how much. 
So you take that information that they've already studied. So this team now you put in the Lugna and the other team in the uh, seventh house and you judge. That's maybe the hardest part is assigning the Lugna to which team. To which team. It's not just that whatever Lugna is, that's the home team. It's the favorite one that's in the heart. It's the favorite when you're pulling a game chart. But now, Kapil, if you ask me and you say, Simon, you're the professed expert. Who's going to win uh, the India versus somebody game? Now that is a, I can do as a Prashna. Prashna. And now I'll put in the first team that you mentioned. So if you said, who's going to win, India or Pakistan? Then I'll put India in the Lagna, Pakistan in the seventh. Okay. Because now I'm entering the space-time matrix of your question. My question, okay. Um, so it's always up to you as the Jyotishi. You are the center of the web. You are the interpreter. If someone asks you, uh, for example, so Kapil, who do you think is going to win? You can cast a chart for the first sound that they said. They said, so, so. Uh -huh is ruled by the moon in the Sanskrit alphabet, right? So you put cancer as the lagna. Or if they say, Kapil, who do you think is going to win? K is ruled by Mars, and the Mars sign Aries specifically. So you can make a, a prashna based on the first sound that they utter. And this is done in India a lot when people don't have computers, but they have an ephemeris, so they know, all right, today, Moon is in such and such place. Sun is here. Yeah. Jupiter is there. They hear the first word you say, and they cast that prashna. And based on that prashna, they'll tell you what's going on. Or the first sound of your name. So there are many ways to get around this, this idea of uh, who's the favorite, who's the underdog. But for, and because Jyotish is in, flexible, like all of the Vedic Vidyas, you know? Sometimes an Ayurvedic doctor will look at you and say, you know, your left kidney is, is, uh, has a stone. And you'll be like, wait, how did you know? What, what, did, you didn't do my analysis. And they'll just say, well, there's just something about your face and I've seen this before and I know it. So the Vedic Vidya is part science, it's part magic. Yeah. Um, and are you do you teach this? Like if somebody wants to learn about sports? Yeah, um, we just finished our first 12-week uh, course on winning with Vedic astrology. And so we covered, we covered a lot, actually. We covered sports, like we were just talking about, but also horse races. And um, I'll probably be running that course uh, again soon. Okay. Uh, it's, it's a lot to learn, but I think in 12 weeks, you get a really good handle on how to do it. And we do it live. Like we'll look at some sporting games and go, all right, let's see what's happening. And, you know, wow. usually we, we get it right. It's fun. And where, do, where can people go to learn this from you? Uh, spirittype.com. Probably the best thing is, and let's do a little shameless yeah. plug here. Uh, this is the book Gambler's Dharma, which okay. is um, all the oh, techniques. Oh, you have a book on it. Okay. Yeah, all the techniques are in there, but um, um, spirittype.com is my website and you can uh, get in touch with me. Okay. Now, what are some of the misconceptions that you started with learning astrology Then you're like, oh no, that's not true. You know how people are like so fearful of Saturn. They feel like, oh my God, Saturn is going to come and this is going to happen, but then they end up getting something. So that, that was kind of like my misconception to think that Saturn is all bad, 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 when it actually it turns out to be good in most cases. So what are some of the uh, most evident misconceptions you came across that you feel you have a different opinion now? On them? Yeah, well, Sadasati is one of those, right? Where most of people's great achievements will happen during Sadasati if you're open to the change that Saturn brings. Um, because three things happen in, in any sati. The first is um, a, a change of career. Saturn asks you, is this what you really want to do for the next 30 years before I come back? The second thing he asks is, is this who you really want to be with in your life, relationships? And the third thing is, is this where you really want to live? And so those three issues, now in ancient 
agrarian societies, you know, moving is, is a big deal. And this is why Sada Sati is probably seen as a very difficult thing in, in India and in other places. But these days, I could just pick up and move to another apartment or another apartment, city. Yeah. It's very no easy. problem. And Saturn asks you that question. Are, is this your best? Is this your, are you living your highest truth in this relationship, in this house, in this profession? And if you can answer yes to those questions, then you're fine. If you answer no, then he has you change. But it's all evolutionary. It's all dharma. He's the lord of dharma, right? Yeah. So the point is to move you forward. So that's one misconception. Um, you know, one thing that I hate is listening to scientists talk about astrology as a pseudoscience, as, mm. as, as uh, charlatanism, when they've never studied it. And not only that, when they refuse to look at some of the uh, studies that have been done on astrology that show a, a consistent correlation with, with, you know, with, uh, with the predictions coming out the way they're supposed to come out. That really pisses me off, actually. That is so funny you say that because, you know, people comment on my YouTube channel, like, oh, uh -huh. you're just a charlatan, you're scamming people by doing this hocus pocus stuff. Mm -hmm. Before, I used to be like so mad. I'm like, this is not Western astrology. This has divisional charts and this has Dasha system. It is divine and it goes into the time of birth. I'm like, okay. So then I put myself in the other guy's shoe. I'm like, this guy will not give a shit. Yeah. You know, I try to explain him. He wants results. It's And it's funny you bring that up because just three days ago, I made a um, video on politics and uh, government career. In there, a person says, well, in Vedic chart, my son comes into this sign and this and this sign. I'm not this personality. Mm -hmm. And I reply to him, this should be there right there on top uh, on that video. I said, look, first of all, you can camouflage all predictions, whether your son is in Gemini or your son is in Libra or your son is in mm -hmm. I can say, well, you're a dynamic person. You're very creative. You are in a leadership role. You love sports. It, it can and that'll be $150, please. $150. Thank you. So then what I did is he's like, okay, here's my birth details. If you can do this, I'll have you, I'll have you meet Angelina Jolie in Florida. I'm like, it's okay. I don't need to meet her. But then what I did, and I don't do this every time because there's like a thousand comments like that. I just did like a five. I looked at his chart for one minute. I gave him like a whole spiel in the comment section. And then he's replying. Oh, that's 90% plus accuracy. Wow. Thank you so much. I, I will look at your books and your thing. And so that's what I say about the scientists too, who are trying to say bogus. I'm like, just look at the practical solutions first that before you open your mouth and say, you know, this is. Yeah. I just want to know, did you meet Angelina Jolie? No. Well, I, I just replied to him three days ago. So he's like, I'll arrange a meeting with the, uh, Angelina Jolie. With well, you. you better it's hold him to here on the video right now. You can go see it. Okay, um, good. I told okay. him, okay, look, this is, oh, you love this, this, and this, and these are your behaviors. And then, and I gave him like predictions with dates. I'm like, wow. this happened here, this happened here, this happened here. And he's right. So I'm not going to do that for That's amazing. people, but I stopped arguing with them. I'm like, I'm not going to tell you what the Vedic astrology is. Mm -hmm. I'll just show you what well, now you want to expect ex, accept it. Okay, fine. But so that's amazing. You know, everyone has their niche and um, you know, I'm terrible at like 90% of the Jyotish uh, aspects of Jyotish. I can't predict an earthquake or tell you, you know, yeah, it's just your specialty that you're attracted to, you know, but I know, you know, certain areas that I know and, and, and they've produced consistent results. So when I hear people bad mouth astrology who haven't studied it, that yeah. you know that's irritating um but that's brilliant kapil and and that's you know the the thing that wins people over is that sincere because that's sincere presentation of of the craft yeah um yeah. because we astrologers are the reason people don't like astrology some of us who are you know that we there are charlatans doing yeah. that. there are people who are you know just doing pseudoscience and telling people, oh, you're wonderful, everything's going to be great. Right. And yes, uh, I take MasterCard and Visa, you know? Um, and so we are, at, we are at fault, but also there are many of us, yourself included, you know, who are spreading the light and, uh -huh. and I, I honor that. And we need more people like you doing it.
Well, I'm, I'm surprised you're not doing it. You should be out there doing it. You got so much more knowledge. I mean, I'm just like, the thing is about you is just, when I saw just your one video, I'm like, man, this guy just knows. Like you took five minutes in that function or, or that Vastu Shastra video. Mm -hmm. and you like pretty much gave the entire knowledge of Vastu Shastra in five minutes. Well, there's three things you need to know. You're looking nice strong. You're looking nice strong. Everything else, boom, falls into place. You know, one time I went, a student of mine at the Institute said, hey, come over to my house and do the Vastu. And I went over to her place and she had a big furnace right in the center of the, of the apartment. And I kind of walked around and I thought, and I asked her, did somebody die here? And she looked at me like, why? I said, you know, this furnace in the middle of the apartment, it's like having someone sitting on your chest, you, you know, the center of your body. And just over time, it creates depression. It creates lack of self-confidence. And she said, actually, the lady killed herself. We used to live here. I'm like, and you want to live here? Why? <laughs> yeah. But she ended up staying there and we tried to, you know, fix it up. We put mirrors all around it and stuff. But the point is, in, in, in Vastu, there are very simple rules. Keep the center open. Keep the house uncluttered if possible. I remember from your lesson where you talked about Ayurveda, where our center has to be empty. For yeah. Five to six hours, right? I was okay. watching your DVD. <laughs> so I and, know that. And this is the yogi secret. The secret. They say, yoga shitta vritti nirodha tadadrashtu svarupe vasthanam. Means yoga is the cessation of the fluctuations of the mind stuff. But what people don't get is the mind stuff isn't just between your ears. It's between your neck and your pelvis. It's your gut. And your gut is always doing this, moving food along. This is called vritti. This is activity. And so when you can calm that vritti, this is yoga. And then the seer abides in itself, meaning then God comes in and you abide in your oneness. So the same thing with your house. If you can, I mean, look, my house is a mess too. It's one thing to preach it, another to practice it, right? But we aspire to that. So your, the same thing you do to your body, you should do to your house. Keep the center open. Keep your house decluttered. There are guys on, on TED and on YouTube right now who are making millions of dollars preaching this very sim simple thing, minimalism. Yeah. Declutter your home. Yeah. If you don't need it, don't buy it. Exactly. Like this is basic Vastu. This is basic, right? I mean, it was so amazing. I mean, I want to know more of these little tricks from you. So do you have you written a book or do you have like lessons on these Vastu? Yeah. Um, yeah, so all of this stuff that I'm talking about is in my second book called Sex, Love, and Dharma. Okay. And it's a, it's a bad title. I'll tell you why. Because I, I was giving a talk at an ashram uh, last summer. And peop, you know there was elderly couples and stuff. And they said, oh, Simon G, we love your stuff. Well, we can't buy your book. I said, <laughs> why? Everything's in there. He says, what would people think? It says sex on the cover. And I thought, oh, God. Oh, yeah, Something they're very like traditional, yep. Yeah. Very traditional. I said, rip the cover. They said, no, 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 we don't want to desecrate the book. So there you go. I, I lost out on a sale because of the stupid title. <laughs> um, and I thought it would be a great title to attract people, but it turned out that health, love, and dharma would have been a better title. Mm -hmm. But there's a chapter on Vastu. There's a chapter on special recipes in that book, how to make gold water, for example, how to boil a piece of gold drink that water. Nehru, Pandit Nehru, had his cook, when he boiled the rice, boil a pure 24 karat uh, ring in the rice every day because it gives good speech, good luster, good shakti, right? Really? Yeah, yeah. So this I've is- I've got a, a little gold biscuit. I think my wife has it. So if I just boil that in a you boil it, don't let the sides touch the pan. So you want to suspend it by a string. And oh. um, however, you or sometimes you can use a tea kettle and just suspend it in the water, boil the water, let it boil for, you know, five to 10 minutes. Like if you're making rice, for example, most of the water will boil yeah. out. Then you eat that rice and it has a little extra something. Or if you just want to boil your tea with it, do that let it boil for five ten minutes let it steep remove the gold and then drink it now in the summer 
gold is slightly heating. So for those of us who live in very hot places like Arizona, for me, you can do it with silver because silver is antibacterial and cooling. Um, but those recipes are in the book, Sex, Love, and Dharma. Why can't well. you let the gold touch the side of the... Um, that's a good question. That's actually a really good question. Um, because it is so. <laughs> is that that, that was my teacher's answer. That was the Dr. Lod's answer when he couldn't come up with an answer. He would say, because it is so. Uh, my feeling is it's because you don't want the metals interacting with each other um, okay. or, 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 you know, the gold is very soft. It's a soft metal and the, the sides of the kettle get very hot and you don't want, you know, to bump the gold or to, to, to uh, deface it in some okay. way. That's my guess. Okay. And I just listen. What is your... Um... Thoughts on nakshatras, how important are they and how much do you integrate them in your reading? Nakshatra is everything. So when a Western astrologer says, hey, I'm a Scorpio in the West, but does that mean I'm a Libra? I don't feel like a Libra. Yeah. And you're like, no, 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 no. We don't look at personality with your sun sign in Vedic astrology. We look at it through your moon star. So that's called a nakshatra. The word nakshatra means couple things, either that which doesn't waste away, ksha, naksha, that which doesn't waste, so a fixed star that never goes away, or naksha, tra, tra means to traverse, to travel, ksha is space, naksha, so that which doesn't move through space, so that's, again, which is fixed, which is a star, or a group of stars. So your moon nakshatra is your the key to your personality in, in Vedic astrology and that's what we look at um, so so that's what I tell Western astrologers now nakshatras are amazing man it's yes. amazing, yes. amazing stuff so rich I mean you think you've gone through all the levels and then there's another level yeah, yeah. Um, for example um, Ashvini nakshatra did you know that people born or who have a significant Ashwini nakshatra, um, well, for one, they may have prominent nose and teeth because we're talking about horses, right? Yeah. Um, number two, they may have a nostril, if Ashwini, if there's a malefic there, deviated septum. Yeah. Um, but then going a deeper level, Ashwini, of course, healing, everyone knows that, right? Healing, gold. Uh, sales at the swift nakshatra but for some people let's say the ninth lord or the fourth lord is in ashwini then that person's parents may have married someone from a different caste meaning from a very different socioeconomic uh, status so i asked one girl that and she said and she had a malefic there too and she said that was the major quarrel between my parents. My mom's Japanese, my dad's white, and they could never merge those two cultures. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's because the Ashwini Kumaras were very ambitious about getting into heaven, right? Having, being part of the gods, but they were lowborn in the sense that they, were, they weren't divine and they had to earn their way up. So there is disparity with Ashwini people, for example, about uh, moving up in, in society and, and they want to move up and sometimes they marry up. And so that's another level. I mean, and all the nakshatras have these deep little inner secret myths that the more you get into them. And I've, I've been blessed to have learned the nakshatras from my teacher Hart, but, you know, there are many good books on them out there and... Um, yeah, I love the nakshatra. Now, we're, like um, you were saying about moon nakshatra, do you find moon nakshatra, which one do you think will have more profound effect or equally moon nakshatra or the ascendant nakshatra? Because yeah. ascendant is the lagna, the, the creator of your karma in this plane. L lagna nakshatra, in my opinion, uh, should come first. Uh, unless the moon nakshatra is the same as a few other planets. So let's say you have the moon, Mars, and Rahu in Ashwini then that's going to become a big theme versus just your lagna. But typically, the lagna nakshatra I look at first. 
Okay. Yeah. And what are the padha mean? I know the padha meaning lands a planet in a different sign in the Navamsha, but is there an actual meaning of padha one, padha two, padha three, padha four? What is that padha mean? Uh, there is Kapilji, but I don't uh, I don't go to that level of detail except to extract the sound from that padha. So, um, for example, if someone wants to start a business and it's a daycare center, I'll look at the moon because the moon is daycare or, you know, whatever good business planet they have and look at the nakshatra pada and find the sound. So if, you know, it's uh, 13 degrees Aries, chuche cho la, so the sound la. Um, so I use the sounds of the padas, the nama nakshatras, right? But in terms of interpretation, the first one is better than the second or worse than the third. I, I don't go to that level. Okay. So I can't uh, answer. Okay. And the other question that I wanted to ask you is if when someone comes to you for a reading, I say, Simon, I want to know my destiny. What is my destiny? I know I'm doing this lawyer work. What is my destiny in this life? How do you yeah. look at that? How do you answer that question? What do you might look in a chart for destiny? Well, that's the real thrust of my work. All this sports stuff and the gambling is fun. It's a hobby. It's a way to test techniques, see if they work. But my real work is uh, helping people find their dharma because um, my teacher used to say that it's the astrologer's job to put themselves out of business. Meaning, you teach your client, you get them to understand their dharma so well that they never need to come back. In the Bhagavati, yes. Very Same true. thing with the doctor. It's the doctor's dharma to seed that durable health in you and, and to teach you how to take care of yourself so that you only need the doctor in emergencies. You don't need to come back, you know, five times a year. Mm -hmm. So in the Vedic tradition, it's our job to teach people dharma. And I, I find that if people know their purpose, everything follows from there. So I've developed these five dharma types and I've written a whole book about it called The Five Dharma Types. And so I look in the chart at the person's dharma and half of my readings are talking about how specifically they can express that dharma. So if they're a warrior type, what does that mean? Um, if they're a merchant type, you know, how does that apply to their life situation and so on. So that's what I do. I, I, for me, dharma is number one. And for that specifically, are you paying attention to like the ninth lord or Jupiter? Yeah, so uh, it's a good question. So to find the dharma type, you can look at where the first lord goes in the chart. So the first lord in the fifth will give us either an educator or a laborer, and you have to narrow it down from there. First Lord in the 11th will either give us a merchant, most likely, or an educator secondarily. So I look at the First Lord, where the Lugna Lord goes. If you're still stuck, you can look at where the Ninth Lord goes. Okay. Because okay. Ninth is the highest of the Dharma houses. Now, like some of the Lagnas may have like four rulers, you know, like the Scorpio, Aquarius, mm -hmm. Rahu and Ketu, they say like in Parashara, it's called mm -hmm. Aquarius. Will you also look at the two things because i know i think you don't uh, st uh, you don't go on to the sign placement of the sign rulership of rahu and ketu right um you know i do because rahu has dignity in aquarius because um uh shanivat rahu uh kujavat ketu right rahu acts like saturn and, yeah. and ketu acts like mars so um so, uh, Rahu does well in Aquarius, Ketu does well uh, in, in the signs of Mars, Scorpio. Um, I take the exaltation of both Rahu and Ketu to be Scorpio. Okay. And the logic behind that is that I have this very kind of silly way of assigning the signs. So Taurus is an agricultural field, Yeah. yeah. right? It's the farmer's field. And Scorpio is the jungle. Mm -hmm. It's where medicine comes from, but it's also where insects are. There's, uh, there's lots of poison there, right? The scorpion's tail, and there's all kinds of dangerous creatures. Well, Rahu and Ketu are snakes. It's a snake, Naga deity, right? So when you see them in Taurus, when a farmer sees a snake, they're going to want to kill it. Yeah. yeah. But the snake thrives in a jungle environment. So... 
I find the exaltation of both Rahu and Ketu to be Scorpio, and both of them are debilitating for us, according to uh, the way I was taught. But because they're Chayagrahas, they're shadow uh, planets, uh, and I, I use the word planet in the Greek sense, moving through the sky. Yeah. That which yeah. moves through the sky is a planet. It's yeah. the sun and the moon. Uh, because they're Chayagrahas, it's hard to pin them down. So if whatever system works for you, they oh, do well in Gemini and Sagittarius, they do well in Aquarius, um, uh, they do well in the ninth house and the third house. I, I find all that to be true. I think it's just, uh, okay. that's not a either or scenario, okay. in my opinion. My last question to you is about the integrating of the outer, outer planets of Uranus, Neptune, Pluto. Have you tested with those what's your opinion on that if you have aside from playing with the word uranus yeah oh my god uranus is so big right now it's amazing no. uh, uranus and neptune and pluto are western uh discovered planets and i write about them in gambler's dharma because the year that neptune was discovered for example is the year we started refining uh crude oil um, and, and, and using oil to as a fuel source, and Neptune rules oil. Mm -hmm. It's the year that ether was invented as an anesthetic. Neptune rules anesthesia and sleep. It's the year that a bunch of idealist philosophies, including communism, the manifesto published by Marx, came to light. So Neptune, with the discovery of these invisible planets, they they begin to affect society collectively. The, the year Uranus was discovered, we had all kinds of revolutions. We had scientific discoveries. The year that Pluto was discovered, I think a year before we had just uh, discovered antibiotics. Pluto is this little tiny planet that has big effects. Mm -hmm. So antibiotic is working on the tiny microcosms my, my, or microorganisms. And then a year later, we split the atom the tiniest part of nature with a big effect. So these planets work. They are grahas. But it's, that's the interesting thing. They begin to work, it seems, when we pay attention to them. And so when they were discovered, they began really introducing their effect in, into our lives. Do I use them in Jyotish? Occasionally. When they are conjunct, say, the Lagna or the moon or, or a sensitive planet, yeah, I'll, I'll use them because I know what they mean and the effect they have. So okay. definitely. Perfect. Great. Thank you so much, Simon, for coming and giving me your presentation. That's it. We're just getting started. I know. Let's keep going for all day. <laughs> no, you're a very, very busy person, I know. But if um, again, uh, if somebody wanted to learn from you, get a reading from you, where can they go? Uh, spirittype.com is Perfect. my is my website. And I appreciate, uh, yeah. Um, uh, appreciate you mentioning it. And Kapil, thank you for the work that you're doing. I want to say, um, yeah, just keep up the good work and keep spreading the light. Thank you. And you kind of become one of those lights now on yeah. my Christmas tree. <laughs> so, All right, right on. Thank you so well, much. You, yes, thank you. Thank you for having me. Appreciate okay. it.